This video is a response to one of ContraPoint's most oldest and the most deceiving videos you can ever find. A video to which I finally have plucked up my courage to respond. Because as we all know, it is a very controversial subject and could have consequences for me if I dare to present it from the wrong angle. And so that you know, I won't be taking any sides here, but will instead try to adequately move you through ContraPoint's lies and do a little bit of mansplaining here. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, I present to you what is fascism and how to properly identify one, at least according to ContraPoint's. And if you expect from her a single Google search on what is fascism exactly, Please don't, since we are dealing here with one of the most deceptive people on YouTube that will lie to push their agenda. So beware, this will contain a lot of loaded language and strawmans. But before I will address any of these, it is important for people to truly understand what fascism is all about. And I think if you are lazy enough to read the fascist manifesto or to study its many forms and manifestations from Pinochet to Estado Novo, a best Google search will do enough. Arguably the best scholar on fascism is Robert Paxton, who has summarized fascism in his essay on the five stages of fascism in the following way that you can see in front of your screen. But now let's hear her definition of fascism and see how it does not accurately represent reality. 1. People of European heritage are or ought to constitute a biological, cultural, and political unity known as the white race, sometimes dog-whistled as Western culture. Two. Jews are masterminding the destruction of the white race through multiculturalism and non-white immigration, a plot that fascists call white genocide or ethnic replacement. 3. The only way to save the white race is to establish a white homeland, or ethnostate, from which non-whites and degenerates must be purged. And if you compare the real definition of fascism to her little list that she made on the spot, you will see that she describes a different group of people who are not necessarily fascist, but instead some extremely deranged white nationalist and conspiracy theorist if they truly believe in those core beliefs. And by the way, the goal of this video is not to deny that those people exist in the first place. In fact, I've spoken with some of those lunatics on my Discord server and tried to convert them back to reality, but it's more to debunk her false assertion that nationalism or white identitarianism is fascism. And the reason why she is using the word fascist here is simply to associate white identitarians with fascists because that tactic would help her to automatically summon a sense of aversion in her audience towards the people who she labels as fascists, who as we have already established are not real fascists, and that is what will happen more throughout the videos, but instead of playing along I have decided to call these people truly for who they are, that is white identitarians, white nationalists or conservatives, and by the way I'm not talking about her little three point list that she has brought up before because those people are clearly of the scale of insanity and I believe that I should not even address them in my video. But anyways, let's deconstruct this video of hers. She played a video clip by Richard Spencer in which he attempts to provoke in white people a sense of their identity, you know, something Kendrick Lamar or Ice Cube does 24-7 to blacks and other identity groups without facing any backlash. But her rebuttal to that in a passive-aggressive manner has shown me that she hates when white people are proud of their heritage, she does not only denies their right to be proud of their heritage, but also tries to add a little bit of that good old white guilt into the mix. Just be sure to be extra proud of the parts of your heritage that involve buying and selling other human beings as property mass slavery that white people apparently did not go through and were the only ones to initiate as well as the last to abolish. And it is no wonder that she has received her education in college, since it is very hard to finish college without hating white people at this moment in time. So I'm not really surprised that our institutions facilitate hate. The most basic way to resist fascism is to recognize its propaganda for what it is. Yeah, who is the stupid idiot to follow for the trap that he has an identity as a group? Give me a break. 
But before we move on onto her actual identifying white identitarians and me commenting on it, let's hear her best and the only argument against an ethnostate in which she tried to imply that multiculturalism basically is not a threat to a homogenous society and did it in a weird particular sort of way. That is, one's enjoyment of Beethoven or white babies is in no way threatened by the proximity of people with a different skin, culture and traditions. The idea that appreciating European culture is in some way linked to establishing a white ethnostate is just nonsense. Your enjoyment of Beethoven or white babies or whatever it is you get off to is in no way impeded by the proximity of people with different skin colors and traditions. Well, that is a very ignorant assertion that one may ever make because it automatically implies that those people will not have enough influence on society, which is called a bigotry of low expectations. In reality, they will have an influence even though if we live in a society that is not officially multicultural which means according to Google and Wikipedia and even my textbook, the existence of separate cultures within society, meaning you cannot force your fellow citizen to learn your language or your traditions, because as we all know, all traditions and cultures should be distinct. Cultural appropriation is bad and we must protect them all from the oppressive influence of the dominant culture, which in turn translates into constant virtue signaling and praising of everyone who did not originally build one's country at your expense, not to mention. And that is the case, of course, if you are from the West. Now, when those identity groups are put on a pedestal and giving a very loud microphone, they will ultimately silence your voice and the enjoyment of things that give you meaning. I think you agree that all people have their own interests in mind and it is a sad case that many people's personal interests would go against the interests of other people. As a materialist and a Marxist, I think you should know better, such as the statue of Christopher Columbus or Teddy Roosevelt that although were liked by most white people in America, they were not liked by other identitarians and were removed at the expense of white people. Now, that will never have happened if those identity groups did not receive the amount of power that they hold now, and if the majority identity group did not believe in multiculturalism, an ideology by which they ought to capitulate and sacrifice their own identity for the sake of amplifying other people's identities. But let's still go to that stupid Beethoven example she has brought up, and as a person who went to a high school in a very multicultural place, although still sticking with my group of course, I have often been giving a bad look for liking classical music and you know all that white shit, because everyone around me was listening to the dominant rap music that would affirm black identity and popularize degeneracy. And there was a specific time in my high school when I had a conversation with a lefty person of a non-white descent about music, in which I happen to say that I love classical music and have listed a few of my favorite composers before his face has changed and he looked at me with a very gloomy expression and said the following words, oh, I hate them all. And I did not even ask why, because we both knew why, so I instead changed the topic of discussion before finally saying goodbye. During that moment, it was plain obvious to me that just like Christopher Columbus, white babies, math and other things that were largely created by whites, classical music had become politicized and problematic. I guess to be a better white person, I had to say that I listen to all kinds of music and I especially love black music so that I would not initiate a conflict. So no, by having people in proximity that are set against your interests and do not share your values, you cannot enjoy your interests or even hold your values in public. That is assuming there are many people who don't share your culture in your proximity of course, and let's not even bring up the environment that could be changed as a result of those people migrating into your country and that environment would have an impact on you, like forming your interests. But regardless, guess what? You are dependent on your environment and better not say or do anything that will portray you in a negative light in that environment, such as having white babies, thereby contributing to white supremacy. It is like saying one's enjoyment of being a gay man does not determine based on the perception of gay people in that given society. 
After she gave her best argument on why you shouldn't be a white identitarian, she has referenced a post by some self-proclaimed alt-rightist on 4chan in which the user has argued that the alt-right better have some optics if it wants to appeal to white people. Hence, you can consider this a beginning of her listing signs that a supposed white identitarian might have, because spoiler alert, none of those signs may expose a fascist or a Nazi. Instead, consider it a guiding book to identify identify white identitarian so that you can ruin their life. Strategy 1. Outright denial. Never reveal your power level. Disavow anyone who reveals their power level. This means that if someone acts like a fascist, has fascist beliefs, repeats fascist talking points, and hangs out with other fascists, the fact that they publicly denounce fascism should be worth absolutely nothing to you and shouldn't even enter into your consideration of whether they're a fascist. And here is another example of her manipulations, in which she, instead of showing an actual fascist, she focused on Lauren Southern, a somewhat racially conscious libertarian that denounces fascism every single time, but not according to Queen Bee of Degeneracy. After all, I'm not a fascist is exactly what a fascist would say. Depends if they are socially acceptable or not, and I will repeat it again, she falsely claims that white identitarians are fascists and we don't even know whether Lauren Southern is truly a white identitarian, especially considering her latest views. Strategy 2. Euphemism Of course I'm not a fascist. I'm an alternative ethno-nationalist simply trying to preserve Western values. Fascists constantly shift their terminology in order to avoid the negative connotations that develop around the names of their movements whenever people figure out what they really are. So they insist they aren't Nazis or white supremacists, just white nationalists or alt-right. But as people catch on to the fact that white nationalists and the alt-right are just Nazis, they'll shift their terminology again and start telling you, I'm not a white nationalist, I'm an identitarian. By the way, as a person who is somewhat familiar with those buzzwords, I will tell you the following. A white nationalist is a person who would want a homeland for white people, aka a white ethnostate, while a white identitarian is simply something like a Black Lives Matter but for white people. They do not necessarily argue for a white ethnostate, but just engage in identity politics just like any other identitarians. But it's still the same bastards, they're just using a different name. They'll also use euphemisms for core components of their beliefs. If talking about preserving a homeland for white people sounds too fascist, they'll talk about preserving Western civilization or Western culture instead. Wait, are you saying people of other races will not preserve the Western civilization? And if it's considered hate speech to advocate purging non-white people, they'll talk instead about purging immigrants, criminals, rapists, and terrorists, and leave it to the audience to catch the color coding on their own. I'm sorry to break your delusions, but most of them don't wish to purge anyone who isn't white. Even their most influential leader, Jared Taylor, just wants to limit immigration without purging anyone of the land. You as a person that is somewhat familiar with how the alt-right supposedly operates cannot really be that dumb or dishonest when you decrypt them. Have you ever really listened to anyone from the alt-right? Strategy 3. Pedantry. It's absurd to call me a Nazi. The German National Socialist Party hasn't existed since 1945. That's right, and I bet he's an isolationist too, not an expansionist like the Nazi. And I bet you enjoy overgeneralizing everything and compare white identitarians with Nazis, but would never dare to compare other identitarians with them. This is a strategy you play along with other leftists, and someday I will finally make a video about it. Fascists use this kind of selective pedantry to dodge derogatory labels, and also to bog you down in a petty terminological dispute. This is a good way to waste your time divert your attention away from whatever led you to call them a Nazi in the first place. Uh, by the way, I like the fact that ContraPoints has admitted that the intellectual level of her community is pretty low, and that she also advocates for derailing the intellectual conversation for the sake of name-calling. Thank you for your honesty. I'm not a white supremacist. I don't think that whites are superior to other races. I simply think we deserve a homeland of our own. 
as do our peoples. Yes, that's a rather good summary of the United Nations' right to self-determination that already, by the way, worked to establish many states throughout Africa, Eastern Europe and Central Asia and currently is a justification for many people to have their own country and exist without being conquered like Kurdistan. And next he's gonna tell us that since Asians have the highest IQs, he's if anything an Asian supremacist. Well, that would be the position of a race realist, uh, but you don't necessarily have to believe in biological determination of race to have a state for your own people. And then you'll get sucked into arguing about IQ. Oh no, leftist, avoid talking about IQ, close your ears and eyes and just run away, unless you want to be forever corrupted. And by the way, the IQ is so old, I think race realists have to shift their focus to SAT scores, because those facts are rarely mentioned in the race realist discourses, but that's just a recommendation. Instead of talking about the fact that the main goal of the politics he supports is the political and social supremacy of white people over all other Americans and Europeans, in other words, white supremacy. Yes, that is called white supremacy, but again, there are very few of them left now in the old right. Most of the people there would just prefer a homeland for their own people or even be a white identitarian. And by the way, notice how many labels she has thrown just in the last minute. Fascist, Nazi, white identitarian, white supremacist, white nationalist, yet wants us to believe that they're all basically the same, when in reality they are not. Strategy 4. Secret Symbols by the way, I have skipped the alt-right symbols, but I will just leave this video clip of hers without the context. I wanted to make sure, unlike most politicians, that what I said was correct, not make a quick statement. The statement I made on Saturday, the first statement, was a fine statement, but you don't make statements that direct unless you know the fact. These gullible SJWs now think that even the OK sign is racist. Is there anything they don't think is racist? And the gullible centrists will be taken right in. How do you see even the political spectrum? Evil white male nationalists, Nazis and fascists on the far right, white racists on the right, gullible centrists who would swing both ways, meaning they would either fight for liberty and equality or justify the existing cis-normative hetero-white supremacist patriarchy and then there are the leftists who would be smart enough to stand up for minority identity groups but would be dumb enough to reject capitalism and then there is the far left where people do a total deconstruction of whiteness as well as capitalism and a total reconstruction of an ideal equal utopia that they failed to build every single time they tried. The poor centrists, they're so afraid that Antifa is going to punch them because of their hair or their emoji. And you know, some leftists are assholes or idiots. So I should say, you should never assume someone is a fascist just because of their hair or because of the emoji they use. These are only little pieces of a larger puzzle. But white centrists also need to understand that the way you feel about Antifa at political rallies, oh god, what if they profile me and attack me unfairly? That's how a lot of black people feel about the police all the time. And the fascists whose free speech you defend so often are trying to drum up exactly the sentiments that make the police dangerous to black people, and that make it dangerous for queer people to be themselves in public. So, I hope that's something you think about. That was the moment when I got kind of angry and even had to resort to drinking water before writing my response because this is the most ignorant echo chamber privileged thing one can ever say. Just go ahead and google the words white man or white woman and look at the results that you will get. I can guarantee you that at least 75% of them are going to be racist and carrying hate directed to those targeted groups, while the rest are going to be neutral. Here is a little sample of the google results that I got after googling those words. How white women use themselves as instruments of terror. Jessica Crook, Rachel Dolezal, and America's white women who want to be black. Queering Karen, the rise of angry white women. Wellness doesn't belong to white women. When white women cry, how white women's tears oppress women of color. White women as postmodern vehicle of black oppression. I wanted to know what white men thought about their privilege. 
The violent defense of white male supremacy. Trump and his supporters are defending an America where white men can rule and brutalize without consequences. The problem of surplus white men. White men still dominate in UK's academic science, murdering white men and the work of white women. And here is a little quote from that article. Part of coming into conscious adulthood for me has been becoming aware that every week white men will be in the news for trying to kill based on racism and sexism. We won't name them as white men and we won't connect the dots to think about the systems of thought that animate their adventures in harm. No social awareness. And instead of white men, she could use any other identity group and she would immediately be fired from her job for perpetrating hate and racism. But it is assumed, at least in the West, that white men can handle it, since their ancestors have historically oppressed other identity groups. Now, dear white men and white women, do you really want to live in a such society when your opinions are silenced, while the hate that is coming your way is as loud as it gets? And tell me this, would it have a negative perceptions on white people and society when articles like that are being allowed to be published? And now, for the sake of an experiment, google the words black man or black woman on your own and see that over 75% of the articles that you will see will be in their support and reaffirm their group identity, creating a positive perception of that community. Now, if you are not white, Please try to wear our shoes for a moment. What if foreign people have immigrated to your country and then say that you have a certain privilege and should feel guilty about it, while all other mainstream institutions will call you a racist and amplify other people who are not you, as well as to come with racist policies in order to limit your power. Until you are over 50% of the population, and maybe even when you are less, those people will never be called racist because you can't really be racist to the majority group according to the mainstream information. Moreover, you will be declared as the main reason behind why those poor immigrants cannot achieve at the same level as you, while those who can and do achieve are not blamed for their achievements, unlike your achievements that are considered racist and people would come up with discourses on how there should be less of you at a certain place, and even go as far as to reject your rights of having a a homeland for your people if you want to run away from this bullshit. In addition to that, removing all resemblances of your history as a distinct group and not allowing you to be proud of it or get even some sort of a meaning out of it, because it's so stupid to be proud of dead old white men. And now finally, Filth like country points would come up with a few signs on how to properly identify you and by you she really means someone totally different than you. She doesn't mean a person who wants to preserve his people and find meaning in them without harming other people but apparently a totalitarian fascist so that she can justify violence against you and end your social life, effectively making you an outcast. So how would it make you feel? when your whole identity is not only under attack, but is also dismissed outright. Personally, I wouldn't like it one bit. Strategy 5. Camaraderie of the Accused The left accuses everyone of racism. They think all white people are Nazis. If it's acceptable to attack and censor me, they'll come for you next. Fascists have very effectively exploited the general hostility towards social justice warriors, especially online. Unfortunately, not all leftists have my connoisseur's eye for detecting fascism. Oh no, country points, you like it either, come on. It's tactically smart for fascists to make the most of this situation, and use it to pump up sympathy and solidarity from centrists. Well, that's an interesting strategy, but yet again, it's not unique for them, and moreover, if we're really talking about actual fascists, I'm assuming we don't, but regardless, then they don't even look for sympathy from centrists. Strategy 6. Irony jokes, satire, and memes. Of course I wasn't actually being racist, it was just an edgy meme. Can't anyone take a joke anymore, or will the Antifa fascists violently attack you over humor now too? 
Here's a uniquely millennial twist on the racist dog whistle. You shroud your sincere ideas in cartoon characters and memes, and then when called out, you mock your accuser for being a clueless normie who isn't in on the joke. Nicely noted, yet those tactics are not unique to the old right, nor they are particularly effective as most of them are just plain cringe, with the notable exceptions of memes like this one that I believe truly helped the old right. Strategy 7. Shifting Blame why doesn't the mainstream media cover violent anti-white organizations like Black Lives Matter or Antifa? This is essentially just a two quo quay fallacy, especially heinous because of the equivocation between fascist violence and anti-fascist violence, and between white nationalism and black civil rights. With regards to strategy number seven, I have stated my opinion before, and I will just add that it is so easy for you to see the world as black and white, where the white is represented as the collection of all evil, and the black is basically the collection of all good, and that there cannot be any gray area, such as the white really want to be left alone, and blacks also happen to be the most racist people in America, according to Rasmussen reports. So please stop calling black identitarians civil rights activists, because we clearly know that they not only have all civil rights as we do, they actually happen to have a little bit more in the form of affirmative action. And that is just the beginning, since there are those conversations about reparations and many other anti-racist policies that would not only reaffirm black identity, but would also make them legally superior to whites. They might start soon receiving money from white people because of reparations for slavery, and I really doubt that it will end just there. So I'm sorry, they're not pushing for their civil rights, and to say that is very condescending of you. The implication is that activism to reduce urban poverty or violence against black people is just the mirror image of white supremacist ethnic cleansing. Finally, with regards to ethnic cleansing, there are very few ethnocracies who actually practice that. The only ones who do it is China and Israel, who already have received a condemnation for their barbarity and mistreatment of minorities. Shortly after the Charlottesville incident, our proto-fascist president called out Antifa and the alt-left, a term fascists invented to distract liberals and centrists and establish the assumption that there must be some leftist equivalent of the alt-right. Because if you have a word for a thing, that thing must exist. Yes, just like white privilege. Strategy 8. Incrementalism. You don't have to support a white ethnostate to want common sense policies about immigration. Of course I don't support violence against the non-white people already here, but we do have a right to preserve our boundaries in our culture, don't we? The common thread in all fascist strategies is deception and manipulation, often aimed at representing what is essentially an attack on non-white people as a defense of white people and white culture. The fascist's long-term goal is a homogenous ethnostate, which at some point will require massive ethnic cleansing of one kind or another. But of course they won't tell you about that unless they think you're also a fascist. Ah, oh, fuck. Um, I guess since we're full-on talking about ethnostates, I have to do a little bit of explaining of what is an ethnostate in the first place, and that is merely a political unit that is populated by and run in the interests of an ethnic group. It does not necessarily presuppose discrimination of a certain group inside the country and can mean many things and manifest in many forms. For example, they might include repatriation laws that already exist in countries like Armenia, Bulgaria, Croatia, Estonia, Finland, surprise surprise Germany, Greece, Hungary, Ireland, again surprise, Israel, Italy, Malaysia, Romania, Russia, Serbia, and Turkey, or countries like Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea that can have a very strong immigration system that would be so strong to the point that it would require one to renounce their former country's citizenship in order to get accepted. And although those countries are not proclaimed as ethnocracies, they sure have a bias in the selection of immigrants. And moreover, for a true ethnostate, one does not need to explicitly state that their country 
countries in ethnostate like Liberia or Israel did, but rather their country could have 99.9% .9 of their people living in it, just like Australia did until the early 1970s, or have other signs of an ethnostate like Turkey. Moreover, the best predictor of an ethnostate is the migration acceptance index, in which the least accepting countries also happen to be described as ethnostates by most scholars. This idea is only controversial in the West when you look at it through quote-unquote anti-racist lenses. In reality, about half of countries worldwide can to an extent be described as ethnostates or ethnocracies. The sentiment of not allowing foreigners into your country is not on the decline but it is on the rise in many countries and will rise even more after the coronavirus pandemic. And as we can see by this graph right here, the public opinion can be swayed rather quickly. I'm sorry, but I am 99.9% .9 sure that if some countries in the West would close their borders to foreign people, there won't be any ethnic cleansing of the people who are already there. Most likely, they will eventually assimilate into the dominant people and become one of them. Of course, that is assuming that their numbers are pretty low, but even if they were high, mostly they will still coexist peacefully. If they can whip up enough racist sentiment with that rhetoric, they can later turn that energy against the non-white people who are already here. That, by the way, does not represent the consensus of 95% of ethnostaters that have lived past World War II. Your caricature of them is certainly beyond ridiculous. They are not Nazis, just like the majority of people who lived in Australia in the early 1970s or the majority of other Westerners at around the same time, or the majority of Palestinians, Israelis, Japanese, Taiwanese, Koreans, Hungarians, Estonians and many other people are Nazis now. Relax, sentiments like that would never lead to fascism and moreover, instead they would lead to social harmony and a liberal democracy, as the least diverse countries are also the ones with a stronger social cohesion and economical success. Not to add that in those countries people would not think every day about race as we do now and would have way more of acceptable topics to talk about over dinner. And let's not even mention diverse countries that can be described as fascists such as Brazil and Chile. Followingly, she talked about how supposed fascists appeal to free speech, but then she finally said the only thing that can be considered the true description of fascism. But remember, fascists do not actually value yes, freedom, bravo, democracy, Sweden, or diversity. Yes, they only yes, value queen. The, race, the people, the nation. Well, except the race part, of course. Those will be national socialists, popularly known as Nazis. So in a sense, yes, I am a little bit paranoid. The other day, the ACLU tweeted a picture of an adorable blonde child with the caption, this is the future ACLU members want. And for a second I was like, what the fuck? Because it has a close resemblance to a 14 words meme, but of course it's unintentional, it's the ACLU. Well, holy shit, isn't it sad? And for the leftists who watch me, do you think it is a good idea that the children of my people have been politicized to the extent that even the portrayal of their existence or even wishing more of them creates chaos and massive hate directed towards my people. And it is not because people think that the ACLU are white identitarians, but because they dare to depict whites in a positive light, since the ACLU subscribers got used to see them portrayed negatively. But this paranoia, self-doubt, and questioning of your own perception is the psychological consequence of being constantly gaslit by fascists pretending not to be fascists and communicating in code. Maybe they are not real fascists, Natalie, and you just don't want to admit it. Do not give them a platform. Do not host debates with them on your YouTube channel. If you do so, of course, you can't really degrade them and ostracize them as you would if they were truly fascists. It's lazy thinking to imagine the worst about your enemies. And the video pretty much ends on that note, that you should not be a fascist. And I totally agree with her, you really shouldn't. Although I wouldn't shun you if you were, but I will try to convince you not to be one. But unfortunately, when she speaks of fascists, she really speaks of white identitarians or people with a racial consciousness. But when I speak of fascists, 
I really do speak about fascists, just like most of academics who have based their life on studying fascism. So you can consider that a perfect example of her blatant dishonesty when you cannot attack an idea you label it a certain word that is used to describe another idea and has a negative connotations to it, and rightly so. But if you really thought that it is a good way to decrypt white identitarians, ask yourself the following question. Why would she focus on white identitarians in particular, and why do they need to be decrypted in the first place? She claims to be so aware of how fascists operate, but when she tries to represent their arguments, she fails. In an article by the Los Angeles Times, she has been described by Lindsay Ellis, a fellow bread tuber, as a person who speaks their language, something a lot of leftists can't do, yet she creates an impression that she has never actually listened to what those people have to say without looking at it through her magnifying glasses. She has clearly no knowledge on fascism nor identitarianism, and that is clearly shown by her condescending impressions and romance of identitarians who she thinks are fascists. And ultimately, the fascists are the most easiest target for anyone to attack at this moment of time, so no wonder people go after them. Unfortunately, what her video shows the most is the low common denominator levels of intellectual conversations to which we have fallen to. And I hate to self-advertise, but even my little Discord server has a way more intellectually stimulating conversations that take place on it. And on that note, I really hope that I have dismantled some of the unfortunate myths surrounding identitarianism that you had before, and hence now I consider my intellectual duty to be fulfilled. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for the next one.